So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening and welcome to our first community webinar, Blood Not Bone Marrow, the potential role for blood testing to improve multiple myeloma diagnosis and therapy, hosted by the Community and Researcher Engagement Program at Monash University's Central Clinical School here in Melbourne, Australia. We are so excited to have you all joining us from the comfort of your own homes this evening, from all over Australia and potentially overseas. We hope that you will all enjoy the webinar that we have planned for you this evening. I'll first begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which our speakers and attendees live and meet this evening and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to particularly acknowledge the Boon Wurrung and Wurundjeri clans of the Kulin Nation, who are the custodians of the lands where I live and work and where the Melbourne Monash University campuses are located. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My name is Catherine Carmichael and I'm a research group leader at the Australian Centre for Blood Diseases, which sits within the Central Clinical School at Monash University. I'm also the chair of the Community Engagement Committee, which developed and runs the Community and Researcher Engagement or CARE program at the Central Clinical School. The CARE program was developed to facilitate effective engagement between researchers at the Central Clinical School and members of the community who have a lived experience of a health condition or disease that we study. By understanding and learning from a unique and valuable patient perspective, we ensure that the research we undertake is appropriate, accessible and relevant to the needs of people impacted by those health conditions. An important part of our care program is to run a series of public webinars, beginning with this multiple myeloma webinar that we are hosting this evening. These webinars are intended to provide you all as members of the community with the most up-to-date information on the cutting edge translational research being performed at Central Clinical School. This evening's webinar will be moderated by Professor Andrew Spencer, who is a clinician scientist and world leading expert in multiple myeloma. You will also hear from our expert speakers, Dr. Nicholas Bingham and Dr. Durga Mithra Prabhu, who will be discussing some of the exciting research being performed within the Myeloma Research Group at the Australian Centre for Blood Diseases and the ways in which their research aims to improve diagnosis, therapy, and ultimately outcomes for patients living with multiple myeloma. We will also hear from an experienced consumer advocate. Mr. Henry Blackman, who will provide us with the important consumer or patient perspective on living well with multiple myeloma. Finally, we'll hear from Hayley Beer, Nurse Manager at Myeloma Australia, who will discuss their long-standing partnership with the Myeloma Research Group, as well as the services they can provide for people living with multiple myeloma. At approximately 6.30, we will then conclude with a 30-minute Q&A session with our expert panel members. And our expert panel members will attempt to answer as many questions as they can from all of you attending our webinar this evening. This Q&A session will be moderated by Dr. Karen Alt, Deputy Chair of the Community Engagement Committee and co-founder of the CARE program. To find out more about each of our speakers and panel members, as well as the CCS CARE initiative, please click on the link that will soon appear in the chat box to access a PDF program for this evening's webinar. You would also have received this link in your reminder email today. Before I hand over to Professor Spencer to begin the webinar, I just want to cover some quick housekeeping items. First of all, this webinar is being recorded and a link to view the recording will be emailed to all attendees after the event once it's available online. So if you know of anyone who is unable to make it tonight, please direct them to this recording. Please also feel free to add comments or feedback at any time to the chat box at the bottom of your screen throughout the webinar. We welcome all feedback. If you would like to have a question answered by our expert panel during the Q&A session at the end, please write it in the dedicated Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen. You may choose to ask your question anonymously or have your name listed. Depending on how many questions we receive, we may not be able to address all your questions live. So if you see a question in the Q&A box that you also want answered, please click the thumbs up icon so that that question may be upvoted and move up the list. It is important to note that our experts will not be able to answer any specific questions related to an individual's own personal circumstances, clinical diagnosis or current treatment for multiple myeloma, but they will be able to address general questions related to multiple myeloma from both a clinical and a research point of view. We also welcome any specific questions you might have related to the research that is presented this evening. So without further ado, I will now hand over to our moderator for this evening, Professor Andrew Spencer. Professor Spencer is Head of the Malignant Hematology and Stem Cell Transplantation Service at the Alfred Hospital, Professor of Hematology at Monash University, Head of the Myeloma Research Group, and Co-Director of the ACRF Blood Cancer Therapeutic Centre at the Australian Centre for Blood Diseases, all located in Melbourne, Australia. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> 
Thank you, Catherine, for that very kind introduction. Um, so this is the first of these webinars, so we hope there won't be any wrinkles. Um, I guess the whole purpose of tonight is to reflect on what a complex disease multiple myeloma is and the challenges that that complexity present for the patients, their families, and for the carers, and how with um, ongoing research and new technologies that we're developing, how we may make that complexity less difficult to navigate. So tonight, uh, we're gonna hear from two of the people that work in our lab, uh, Dr. Bingham. Uh, Nick is a uh, hematologist who works in our clinical service, but is also doing a PhD in the myeloma research group. And Nick's gonna reflect on some of the background biology of myeloma and some of the challenges, and also touch upon some of his work. And then we're gonna hear from Dr. Sridurga Mithrapu, who I've worked with for many years. And Durga, really, I think without hesitation, I would say is the leading researcher in the space of liquid biopsies in myeloma globally. She's certainly published a lot more cutting edge work than most. And she has some very exciting data to share with us tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Nick to now kick off tonight's proceedings. Thank you, Nick. All right, so I hope everyone can uh, hear me. My name is Nick. Um, I want to start by thanking the Care Committee for the opportunity to talk tonight and um, discuss a bit about the research that we've been doing. Um, I also need to acknowledge uh, HSANZ, the Haematology Society for Australia and New Zealand, and the Walking Up Hill Foundation, um, which was started by the family of Marina Grunstein, and um, their funding has been um, uh, really vital for me being able to um, undertake um, this research. Uh, so, obviously, um, multiple myeloma is, is one of a spectrum of, of diseases caused by the clonal expansion of plasma cells. Um, and we know, starting with MGUS, um, that as these clonal cells, uh, these clonal plasma cells um, uh, progress and increase in their genetic complexity, uh, they lead to symptomatic multiple myeloma. What I mean by the uh, genetic complexity is sort of explained a little bit in, in, in this graph. Um, towards the left, we've got regular plasma cells, one of which will develop a mutation, which will give it a clonal advantage. It will grow faster than the other cells in the bone marrow. Uh, and as these cells grow and divide, um, uh, partly because of the inherent genetic instability in myeloma, they acquire new mutations. Uh, and these new mutations provide um, some of these little subclones uh, with the uh, ability to outcompete uh, other clones uh, and lead to symptomatic myeloma. And as we apply um, selection pressures, uh, like we start um, administering chemotherapy to patients, uh, different subclones which are able to um, survive that chemotherapy are selected for. So as we progress through um, the stages of these plasma cells to discrages, uh, the genetic complexity increases significantly. The way we usually assess bone marrow, um, multiple myeloma is through bone marrow biopsies, all right? And these are um, uh, relatively uncomfortable procedures and, and we don't do them particularly frequently when we're looking after patients. The issue with bone marrow biopsies um, from a genetic point of view in myeloma is that myeloma is a widespread disease. Uh, this is a PET scan for a patient who's got multiple myeloma. Um, the uh, dark areas indicate um, uptake of the radioactive sugar that we use in PET scans. So anything that uses a lot of sugar, like myeloma, lights up as dark on the PET scan. Um, as you can see, the skeleton of the patient outlined um, here with their bone marrow involvement. Um, but when we do a bone marrow biopsy, we're sampling just one site, whereas we know that throughout the patient, there'll be different clones. The other difficulty is that these um, change over time. And these are PET scans from the same patient. Uh, so after beginning treatment, uh, we see that they um, have a, an excellent response, um, but then later on relapse with some extramedullary disease, which occurs outside of the bone marrow. Uh, um, and we call this, uh, this um, spatial and temporal heterogeneity. So there's a, a variation in, in a single patient and in that same patient over time. The reason this genetic um, diversity is really important and, and um, uh, is the way the plasma cells interact with the environment around them. Usually plasma cells and MGUS and, and particularly early myeloma are really dependent on the bone marrow microenvironment to survive. 
Uh, and this is mediated through specific growth factors that are released by other cells in the bone marrow, uh, as well as adhesion um, molecules. So um, things that bind these plasma cells into the microenvironment in the bone marrow. But in extramedullary disease, um, plasma cells are able to survive outside of this niche. Uh, and what happens with um, extramedullary disease quite frequently is that it also uh, leads to patients become, uh, to um, uh, multiple myeloma becoming resistant to chemotherapies. So there's something about um, the same mechanisms that allow these cells to survive outside the bone marrow that makes them resistant to treatment as well. So what we hope to do is, is to look into the extramedullary disease and figure out if we can understand how they survive and also therefore better target these pathways that are, that are implicated. So for my um, PhD project, um, we're collecting biopsies of patients with extramedullary disease uh, and performing whole genome sequencing, which is a really um, cutting edge technique um, that uh, allows us to really deeply assess um, the genetics of, of, of the extramedullary lesions. We can look at mutations within the gene, um, but importantly, we can also look at changes in the promoter regions, which control the expression of these genes, uh, as well as copy number variations, which have all been shown uh, in various ways to be important in myeloma and um, the progression of plasma cells dysgrosias previously. So the, um, currently we've had seven um, uh, biopsies that have been sequenced as part of a pilot study, uh, but we have a total of 17 patients that have been enrolled. And this is one of the largest cohorts of um, patients in the extramedullary disease with whole genome sequencing that's been published to date. This is just an example of some of the early results. Uh, it's called a Manhattan plot. Uh, and it's a, a um, picture that shows all the chromosomes uh, in different colours. So one is blue, chromosome two is in orange, uh, and they um, move across from left to right. Uh, a normal copy number uh, is shown by being that line in the middle. So most of the uh, chromosomes have got this, the normal copy numbers. We can see, however, that in a couple of them, there are some gains and some losses. So here it represents an amplification of chromosome uh, 1Q, uh, which is a really uh, common finding in multiple myeloma uh, and typically associated with um, a, a high risk feature. And this is one of the first studies that's showing these genetic abnormalities in the actual extramedullary tissue. We've also sequenced the genetic material that we get from these biopsies, uh, and we've identified uh, recurrent mutations uh, that are found in these extramedullary tissues uh, that may also provide us some further information about how um, these cells survive outside the bone marrow, uh, and therefore how we can target them in terms of treatment. The other area of need to touch on um, is to go to the other end of the plasma cell disclosure spectrum and look at, my, at um, MGUS. So in MGUS, um, at the moment, we know that roughly overall in all MGUS patients, about 1% per year progress to get multiple myeloma. We use a couple of risk factors, looking at the size of the paraprotein in the blood, whether the light chain ratio is abnormal and what subtype of paraprotein the patient has. But even if we have these risk factors, um, only about 50% um, 50, well, 50 of patients will progress to myeloma in 20 years. So we follow up all of these people for a very long time uh, without really uh, being able to predict more accurately who is going to progress. And this causes a lot of um, worry and concern for patients that we're monitoring regularly uh, and, and costs money in terms of blood tests and appointments and missed work and all those sort of things. So if we can better predict who's gonna progress to myelo uh, myeloma, uh, that would um, benefit patients significantly. The other area of need in a much more general sense is how we treat myeloma. Currently, it's a bit of a one-size-fits-all um, approach with induction therapy, uh, a stem cell transplant for eligible patients with some consolidation and maintenance therapy. Um, but in a um, sort of in an ideal world, uh, we'd be targeting our therapies a bit more towards the specific mutations that we find in an individual patient's myeloma. And we know that that's a, a um, useful technique because in acute myeloid leukemia, that's a, a common um, feature with a backbone chemotherapy with specific targeted drugs for, for mutations. So um, uh, targeted therapies are somewhere that we're moving towards and we need a better way of assessing um, patients' um, genetic makeup for their myeloma over time so that we can uh, approach this. The other thing we don't do particularly well in, in myeloma at the moment is predicting response to therapy. 
Uh, and most of the time we, we give the treatment uh, and we monitor the paraprotein as a way of um, measuring response, but it's really hard to actually predict whether someone's going to respond to therapy ahead of time or not. Um, Liquid biopsies are really um, exciting potentially in this space in terms of being able to predict who responds or who doesn't. Because one of the things that we would again like to move towards is something called response adapted therapy. Uh, and so in the graph on the right, um, from some data that Andrew's presented um, a couple of years ago now, we know that people who progress early after treatment um, have a worse um, uh, outcome than people who um, stay in remission longer. So in a response adapted therapy kind of model, what we want to do is to predict who's um, uh, not going to do well or identify who's not doing well earlier on so that we can escalate our treatment uh, and improve the outcomes for these patients. The other area of need, as I meant, is um, sort of implied by talking about how we monitor patients is, is patients whose myeloma doesn't make a paraprotein or only makes very small volumes of this paraprotein. Uh, plasma cells normal job and a normal plasma cell makes antibodies that protect us from infections uh, and so 10% of patients um, make a very small amount of, of antibody and about 2% have non-secretory myeloma. And what that means is it's really hard for us to actually measure their disease um, for monitoring response to therapy. Uh, and the other techniques we have to monitor in, in patients who don't have a paraprotein include PET scans, which aren't currently Medicare funded for myeloma, unfortunately. Uh, and as we talked about, bone marrow biopsies, which have the limitations of of not being able to do particularly frequently uh, and um, the, the discomfort and the, the issues with the, the picture they give us. So non-secretory myeloma is an area that um, is, is really um, looking for some improvements in how we manage patients. I wanted to change tack a little bit now and just talk about the myeloma research group and, and what uh, the group is sort of looking into. Uh, Annie's another PhD student um, from Italy who's been looking at um, extracellular um, vesicles. So these are tiny membrane bound particles that are released by cells. Uh, and Annie's shown that um, myeloma cells uh, secrete these um, vesicles uh, and that when we compare um, vesicles these little extracellular vesicles from uh, patients with myeloma from healthy donors, uh, that the myeloma ones actually change the, the cells of the, bo the bone marrow microenvironment uh, and, and help pro um, them proliferate and support the myeloma cells. Uh, and this is a, a wonderful little video um, from her um, research. The blue indicates the nuclei of the bone marrow stromal cells and the red is a rough picture of the membrane. Um, but the the bright green dots are the um, extracellular vesicles. And so you can see over time, these cells are taking up the extracellular vesicles once they've been applied. And it's a way of the, the myeloma cells communicating and, and sort of um, uh, you know, proliferating and um, expanding in the bone marrow. Um, Tiffany uh, Kong is um, uh, a bit of a cell culture, um, cell whisperer. Uh, she's um, created a few uh, cell lines from patient samples, um, which are a really valuable resource um, in terms of research. Uh, these cell lines, um, because they're um, very recently developed, represent sort of true myeloma disease really well. Uh, and so we use these cell lines a lot in um, understanding therapeutics in myeloma. So this graph shows, um, to keep it simple, a blue drug and a green drug, which are not killing too many of the, the myeloma cells and, and just a little bit more than the, the untreated. But when you combine those two drugs together, we see in the red column that this is not just an additive effect, it's synergistic. And so using cell lines is a really great way for us to identify um, potential drugs that we can move into the, to the clinic. One of the ways we go through to, to figure out which drugs should be taken forwards is by looking at animal models, which are a, a, an important part of, of assessing, um, uh, assessing drugs and, and how they um, may be used. Um, these are like uh, little mouse PET scans, which show some um, myeloma in these, in these mice. Uh, and um, we can show, again, by measuring these, the sort of the brightness of these little mice PET scans, uh, that um, when we treat these mice with medications, they actually have less myeloma than if, if they're not treated. And so this is a way of us um, assessing the therapeutics in myeloma. The other um, huge amount of work that the Myeloma Research Group does is supporting clinical trials. 
Um, we have a, a team of RAs who um, uh, process a lot of trial samples um, and the Myelin Research Group is sort of the central Australian lab for a lot of clinical trials. Uh, we also do correlative studies that are sort of run in um, conjunction or a parallel to these clinical trials. Um, we're involved with the myeloma and related diseases registry uh, and a particular um, note is the M1000 Biobank, uh, which is a really ambitious project which is collecting um, samples from 1000 patients that are newly diagnosed with myeloma and with MGUS. Uh, and these samples are at the moment being stored, uh, but we've accumulated hundreds of samples uh, to date and we're starting to look at projects which will be using these um, samples to better understand myeloma and, and improve um, outcome for patients. We're also, in sort of these correlative studies that we're doing at the same time as these um, other clinical trials, we're using some really exciting techniques. Um, when we look at a, a cell, um, we can look at the protein stuck on the outside of the cell, which tells us how that cell interacts with the environment around it. Uh, we usually do that by looking at fluorescent proteins, which um, are bound to antibodies and bind to these little proteins on the cells. Because they use fluorescent proteins, um, it requires a light and the light spectrum means that a lot of these colours overlap uh, and so you can only use about eight colours in the same tube before everything gets too um, smooshed and, and, and overlapped. There's a really new uh, exciting um, uh, method called Cytof, uh, which instead of using uh, a fluorescent protein actually uses a metal ion. So theoretically, we're only limited by the periodic table in how many of these um, antibodies we can use in, in, at any one time. And this gives us really complex pictures of the immune system. And this is really important in myeloma. Uh, and we're doing a correlated study at the moment looking at how the immune system has impacted on patient outcomes uh, in a, a clinical trial. And we get um, just beautiful but complex uh, pictures like this, which show the whole immune system uh, and, and being able to tell how changes in this are, are correlating with patients' outcomes. The other um, thing that we're doing um, in terms of new techniques um, is something called Sky92, the MM profiler. Uh, and um, this uses um, bone marrow biopsies currently, and we take um, a genetic material from that biopsy. Uh, and it provides us with the same information as traditional cytogenetics or, or fish results. Um, but it gives us this added information about gene expression profiling, which has been shown to um, correlate really um, nicely with things like prognosis, but also um, which specific pathways are uh, important in that specific myeloma type. Uh, and it's got a turnaround around time of just a couple of days, which compares with usually sort of weeks with the cytogenetics and fish results. Uh, and we've been able to incorporate um, the Sky92 into some uh, upfront clinical trials, uh, but we're also doing it uh, Sky92 for all newly diagnosed myeloma patients here at the Alfred um, to get this genetic information um, uh, on hand sooner. So um, to conclude with the myeloma research has a, several areas of need um, and the myeloma research group has you know, really got such a broad spectrum of research that we're doing at the moment that's really trying to analyse all of this basic science of my, uh, myeloma biology, um, using that to look at therapeutics and, and drug development. Uh, and one of the areas where we're sort of combining both of those things the best is, is liquid biopsies, uh, which um, I'll leave it there so we can move on to talk, um, have Durga talk to us about that. And good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Durga Mitraprabhu. I'm a senior research fellow in uh, Maloma Research Group. And as Andrew mentioned, um, I've been working in the liquid biopsy area for a number of years now. And the main focus um, for us has been to develop a blood test to address some of the limitations uh, that uh, multiple myeloma research currently has. So one of the areas that we address is the genetic complexity of multiple myeloma. So we know that myeloma is a multi-site disease, uh, but if we were to biopsy several sites within a, or several bone marrow sites and perform genomic analysis, uh, we actually find that each of these sites actually has a different genetic makeup. And what makes things more complicated uh, is that if we were to uh, biopsy three different spots within one bone marrow site, uh, this can also come up with different 
genomics. And these genomics uh, actually dictate response to treatment. And an example of that is shown here uh, in this uh, image. Uh, it is a patient two bone marrow sites from a patient who was undergoing therapy over a period of four months. Uh, and you can see that the disease is actually responding at bone marrow site one while it's growing in the other. So we need a better understanding of a genomics and we need this so we can gain an understanding of the disease biology that can then help us identify patients resistant to treatment. And this will eventually help us to design better therapies so we can uh, either prevent relapse or prolong uh, recurrence of the disease. Traditionally, bone marrow biopsy has been used to do genomic analysis, but as you heard from Nick, it's uh, invasive. It's successful only about 70% of the time, and it is too site specific. So if you did a bone marrow biopsy, you would obtain the genomics of only that specific bone marrow site. So the alternative methodology is a liquid biopsy. And in the next few slides, uh, I will talk about uh, the concept of liquid biopsy, how we do the analysis, what we have learned so far, and uh, what, are, uh, what we plan to do in the future in terms of liquid biopsy and multiple myeloma research. So cancer cells sit in close proximity to blood vessels, and some of these cancer cells escape into the bloodstream. Uh, there's rapid turnover of cells in cancer, and this is a hallmark of the disease. And due to this rapid turnover, cells can actually release their contents into the bloodstream. And this can consist of DNA, which is the genetic code, uh, it can release RNA, which is the messenger between the genetic code and the endpoint, which is the proteins. It can release proteins themselves, and it can also release particles called extracellular vesicles, which Nick uh, spoke about just now. So if you can imagine, you have these different cancer sites within the body, and each of these cancer sites are, are genetically different. So these will release uh, contents into the blood vessel that is a composite of all of the, gen of the different genetic sites in the body. So if we were to do a tissue biopsy, we would get, uh, obtain information only about uh, a site, which is genetic makeup A. But if you did a liquid biopsy, you would have access to the bloodstream, which has um, all the contents of the cells from all of the different genetic sites. So our lab works on different aspects of these. So we work on DNA, RNA, protein, and extracellular vesicles. And so for the purposes of this talk, I will concentrate only on DNA. So the way we collect uh, blood uh, is in special blood tubes called strep tubes. So once the blood is collected, uh, it is spun down at a really um, high speed, which settles the blood cells. Uh, and results in the plasma, which is the clear liquid at the top. This plasma contains the DNA of interest. We then use this plasma to isolate the DNA using a commercially available kit. And once the DNA is isolated, it's prepared and it is read uh, or sequenced in a sequencing instrument. Uh, once the genetic code is read, it is compared to the normal human genome and any changes in the DNA of cancer genes can be identified in the patient. So this is known as gene mutation. Once we identify the gene mutation, this is then checked on a PCR instrument, and this is called a droplet digital PCR, uh, which can pick up extremely low amounts of mutated DNA in a background of normal DNA. And we use this methodology to then look for the levels of mutated DNA at specific time points in plasma of patients undergoing therapy uh, to determine if the levels of mutated DNA can actually predict response to therapy or relapse. So we have done a number of studies uh, using this methodology. And I'm going to present three take home messages from all of the studies that we have done. So take home message one, 
is that if we have a patients with higher number of DNA uh, mutations in the plasma, they relapse earlier than patients who have lesser amounts of mutated DNA. Point number two is that patients who have a specific type of gene alteration. So if a patient has a mutation in a gene called TP53, they tend to relapse earlier than patients who do not have any mutations in this gene. And finally, patients, uh, we compared uh, the plasma mutated DNA from patients before and after five days of treatment. And we found that patients who had a decrease uh, or a reduction in the amount of mutated plasma, uh, mutated DNA in the plasma after treatment were more likely to respond to therapy. So now that we know all this, what do we hope to achieve? And how are we going to address uh, the areas of limitations that uh, Dr. Bingham just addressed in his talk? So one of the areas that uh, we have started researching on is to identify the genetic makeup of patients that are resistant to treatment. And we have done a substantial uh, number of patients for this study. And we have early evidence to show that uh, patients with certain type of gene mutations are more likely to, uh, to relapse on therapy. And I'm going to show you a representative example here uh, wherein we've looked at uh, plasma at three time points from a patient collected at um, start of treatment and at two relapse time points. Uh, we performed genomic analysis for this plasma and found five mutations that were present uh, in this patient across the different time points. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to these two gene mutations, BRAF, which is shown in brown, and KRAS, which is shown in green. Uh, these two mutations were already present at the start of therapy and continued to increase in amounts at both relapse time points, indicating that they, they were not really responding to therapy and they were likely driving disease progression. And these two genes can be targeted with drugs that are already available in the clinic. So the next logical step would be to initiate a clinical trial for patients with targetable gene mutations in the plasma with drugs that we know can target them. And that's what we have done. So this is moving from bench to the clinic uh, where we're going to use a personalized therapy based on a blood test. And this is one of the first studies in the world uh, where we are using a companion diagnostic that is a blood test for multiple myeloma patients uh, to be enrolled onto a specific trial. So in this study, uh, we're going to collect blood samples from multiply relapsed myeloma patients and the DNA will be sequenced. And any change in the DNA of three specific genes that is KRAS, NRAS and BRAF will be identified. If the patient has a mutation in any of these genes, they will be enrolled into a clinical trial called ERASER, which is due to open in Alfred Hospital very soon, that consists uh, of a drug called ATG017 that specifically targets these genes. So this is a prime example of how we can move from bench to bedside. The second area of uh, research that we're doing is the use of a blood test for patients with non-secretory and oligosecretory disease. And so these are patients who do not have a serum marker and therefore they are unable to access clinical trials um, and for patients with extramedullary disease. Uh, again, we have done a substantial number of patients uh, for this sort of analysis as well. And I'm going to show you a representative example. Uh, this is a patient who had a non-secretory disease, so there was no serum marker and had extramedullary disease as well. So the only way to monitor a disease in this patient was through PET-CT. We collected plasma from six time points from this patient and assessed uh, the levels of this mutation, KRAS, and we also looked for total myeloma DNA levels in the plasma.
And what we found was that the levels of the plasma mutated DNA was actually concordant with the PET CT. So this provides us with the opportunity to expand our studies where we can actually um, use a blood test as a companion diagnostic, like the, uh, like the other example that I showed, uh, wherein we can introduce this as a monitoring um, methodology for patients with non-secretory or oligosecretory disease, and that could potentially help them access clinical trials. The final area of research that we are doing with the liquid biopsy is to identify patients who are at a higher risk of developing MM. So the ultimate aim would be to eliminate the myeloma disease burden in the community. And so what we are planning to do is we are going to use the Myeloma 1000 Biobank. So this is the national biobank that aims to collect blood samples from 1000 MGAS patients and 1000 newly diagnosed patients. And we have currently accrued uh, more than uh, 580 patients. Uh, and this project was started about seven years ago with the sole aim of trying to identify a blood-based biomarker uh, for MGAS patients who are likely to develop MM. Uh, and obviously we have uh, expert clinician uh, scientists who are working on different aspects uh, of uh, the components that are present uh, in the plasma, that is DNA, RNA, proteins, and extracellular vesicles uh, in order to find any blood-based markers. So if we did find any blood-based markers, we would then identify MGAS patients who, whom we could then intervene early and, pro and uh, prevent uh, the progression or to active myeloma. So I want to finish off uh, by first thanking the patients and the carers. The support that they have provided to us uh, over these years has been amazing. And it's not just about consenting to give uh, blood or bone marrow samples for us to do the work. Uh, we have patients who have donated to uh, funds to do our genomic research. Uh, analysis and we have patients who provide us with direct feedback about uh, our grant applications and as a research lab we are always in need of funds so we are extremely grateful for all of these patients for supporting us throughout this journey. Uh, I'll also like to thank the Alfred Hospital hematology team uh, who are brilliant in identifying the patients, collecting the material and handing it over to the myeloma research group. And I have to thank generous funding from the International Myeloma Foundation who have supported us right from the beginning and uh, the liquid biopsy project started. James and Elsie Borman Research Trust who has funded my fellowship for the last five years and the National Health and Medical Research Council. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a real privilege to talk with you today as a myeloma patient and somebody who's been receiving treatment at the Alfred. So I'm at the front end, I guess, of the treatment, but just hearing all the people like Durga and Nick today, um, it was refreshing to hear what goes on behind the scenes as well. I was diagnosed with myeloma six years ago when I was 60. I've been having back pain for several years and no one could give me any sustained relief. Myeloma was picked up whilst I was doing a completely unrelated medical test. And bizarrely, I was grateful for that. Of course, I knew about cancer, but myeloma, I'd never heard of it. I was to quickly find out that it was a blood cancer and it was a steep learning curve. I was placed into treatment within a few weeks. I'd heard of chemo, but had no idea how it was going to be administered. It was all a mystery to me. Was I going to be sick with my head over the toilet bowl? Was I going to lose my hair? Early on, I was referred to Professor Andrew and eventually found myself as an outpatient at the Alfred. I like Professor Andrew's approach, telling you like it is. After initial treatment, induction, as you heard Nick mention, with VCD, 
I had a stem cell transplant in early 2016. I was very satisfied with the process to harvest the stem cells at the Alfred and then actual transplant, particularly as the Alfred allowed me to go home until my blood pressure dropped to unacceptably low levels. Things were going well in hospital, heading for a one week stay. I must admit I was getting competitive about that. I was going to beat all comers with my blood markers on a fast upward trajectory until I started getting the shakes. A fever developed and I generally felt crap. Turns out it was golden staff as my Hickman port had become infected. I'm pretty sure it was caused by not wiping and holding for long enough uh, by a particular overnight nurse. It was a valuable lesson for me in taking responsibility for my care as well. I do now to another level. The Golden Staff led to six med calls over 24 hours and it was quite scary. When it settled, I was emotionally drained and burst into tears when my wife visited that afternoon. I also remember one of the nurses who must have sensed I was doing it tough, just sat on the edge of the bed and stayed with me for a while. The memory of that little touch of kindness for him in the ward is etched in my mind and memory forever. Thank you, Big Luke. At first, being analytical in nature, I would research everything and keep tabs on all test results. Now I've learned that when I find the doctor I trust, I let them worry about the numbers. A tip I received from Professor Andrew, and I look after that which I can control. A positive mindset, my diet, exercise, connections with people, managing medication and preparing for any medical appointments. Whew, that is a list, isn't it? The stem cell transplant had some impact that after nine months of a medication holiday, I was back for more treatment. This is when I was introduced to trials and very fortunate to have trials at the Alfred. The Alfred has a dedicated small team looking after the trials and headed by Sally. She is organised and knows exactly what to do in supporting the trial work. After the first trial came to know it, I went on a trial with three agents, Ixazomib, Thalidomide and Dexamethasone. I was doing well and my numbers started to come down. However, about six months in, it was apparent that the thalidomide was starting to give me peripheral neuropathy. I was aware what it could do. If it got worse, I asked the he tending haematologist to stop the thalidomide. It was not appropriate to vary the agents in the trial, so I was immediately withdrawn. It was a good decision, although I'm left with numbness in both feet. Nothing major, but I shudder to think what would have occurred had I continued. Another lesson on this journey. There are many decisions to make along the way. And while you listen to the specialist, I ultimately am responsible. If it doesn't feel right, it probably is not right. And I do work once I've made the decision on not second guessing myself. After a brief spell from treatment, the haematologist wanted to place me on a daratumumab trial, thinking it was the best drug available at the time. I was pretty excited to do this trial, but alas, I did not qualify. Back to the drawing board. I was put on lenalidomide or REV with dexamethasone. Again, I was doing well until I found I had a polyoma virus. Not a good thing to have. It lingers and while I'm not infectious, it needs to be monitored. I was immediately taken off the myeloma drugs, drugs and given five courses of IVIG to build up my immunity to fight the virus. Once the five courses were given, I was back on Rev, but no Dex. Dex was putting pressure on my immune system. I was a little concerned as I've been doing well, but if you know anything about the polyoma virus, it's a risk management exercise 
to continue debts in the face of the virus. The virus is not eliminated, but is kept at bay by having a healthy immune system. I'm thankful that I'm monitored every three months as an outpatient of the ID clinic at the Alfred and particularly the care given by Dr. Orla. The current available treatment for the polyomavirus is fraught with risk, so again, best to keep it at bay. After being on REF for the last three years, recently, and for the first time since my diagnosis, the paraprotein was found to be undetectable. Suffice to say, my wife and I were high-fiving one another. The next step to determine whether I am uh, in remission is to do a bone marrow biopsy, which you've heard a lot about today. So that might be the next step, or maybe I'll be a candidate for um, Durga's work. All the while on my journey, I was getting a monthly Zometa infusion. This is to harden the bones, and I must say I'm grateful for that because in, over the last six years, I've had two falls and no bone breaks, so perhaps the Zometa is working. After doing a test to check my body's ability to remineralize my bones, Zometa has now gone to an infusion each three months at home. Yes, this is one of the great innovations and something offered by the Alfred Hospital. It is so patient friendly. A nurse comes to my home and administers the infusion. You don't have to worry about the parking, waiting, or the frenetic energy you sometimes get in the oncology unit. Giving back. I like the attitude of this research engagement committee to reach out to patients and ask what they want. Which patient would not want a blood test rather than a bone marrow biopsy? Well done to all concerned in this research. We look forward to positive results at the end. I'm reminded to uh, that I was listening to Grace Tame recently. Grace was asking, how can change be effective if you're not talking with those who have the lived experience? I've put up my hand a number of times over the last six years to participate in hospital surveys, focus groups, and as a speaker at myeloma conferences. It's a way I can assist the myeloma community to improve the quality of care for all myeloma patients. So I've given you some idea of my journey as it relates to the treatment path. What about my ability to cope, navigating the health system and receiving support? Almost from the beginning, since my diagnosis, I was fortunate to have found Myeloma Australia. Their support line is amazing, and I think I've rung it about 10 times over the last six years, and always leave the call with more information and some clarity on direction. As you'll hear, in addition, Myeloma Australia have a network of support groups throughout the country. I find these very important in learning and just being with people who are going through a similar journey to myself. I'm sure Haley will say something more about that, these groups as well. There are also plenty of other resources for support out there. For example, the Cancer Council offer telecounseling for support during treatment. I did five sessions early on, which was helpful. I find some things you try for support work, others don't. However, nothing is a waste and it's an opportunity to better know myself and what works for me on my own myeloma journey. The Alfred Hospital is amazing when you're an inpatient. It consistently demonstrates best in class outcomes with its multidisciplinary approach. As an outpatient, the clinical outcomes are also top class. However, once you're an outpatient, you are left to navigate your own health needs on your own. I found myself needing a dietitian, 
physical trainer, counsellor and pain management over the course of my myeloma journey. Each of these I've had to find myself. I'd like to see it improve for all our patients. A holistic portal of information, perhaps better still a centre or a go-to hotline or a nurse manager. Only recently I found out that they have a nurse who's dedicated to myeloma at the Alfred. I can call her and a shout out to Daniela. Previously, I've had to find my own support person and that's worked well. Shout out to Sally J. However, she's not a clinician and therefore I had to go to other places to find the answers that I needed. For example, Myeloma Australia. There are times when I'm overwhelmed by my health issues. Yes, myeloma, but the side effects of the medication, several other major health issues, attending appointments and managing medication. It would be nice, as someone has said to me recently, to have medication where the only side effect listed will say, can give you attractiveness. I'll take that one any day. I know sometimes I must visit this overwhelm or grief space and use what tools I can to ensure I don't live there. I don't like being in the space, but I do recognise it and communicate to my wife, Jan, so she knows what's going on. Might download to my sister or brother or a few close friends in these times. I might also write in my journal, meditate, or watch some uplifting videos, which lets me hear the experience, strength and hope of others in a wide variety of circumstances. I'm determined not to be a victim, but a survivor and master of my own positive mindset on this journey. I stopped work about four years ago, and after a bumpy start, as I did not have any um, established hobbies, or a path for the next phase of my life, I've now found my new normal and have renewed purpose. I've learned to read music and play the recorder, uh, participated in several online courses, volunteered to assist organisations using my skills and assisted family and friends as required. Having a new granddaughter also helps, and I think she's watching, even though she's only eight months old. From the beginning of my diagnosis, and particularly now, I never say I wish not, I did not have myeloma. I can honestly say it's one of the best things that has happened to me. I have a quote etched in the wall in my study from none other than Ernest Hemingway that's been the beacon since my diagnosis. There is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. Thank you for listening and back to you. So thank you all for um, being here this evening and it's been a wonderful um, uh, presentation so far. And thank you to the organising committee and the Monash group for um, giving us at Myeloma Australia an opportunity to present to you this evening. So many of you um, will be familiar with Myeloma Australia and I can see lots of familiar faces in the, um, in the list and it's a shame we can't um, be together in the same room. But I'd just like to take a few minutes to um, walk you through um, Myeloma Australia. So we um, were, are a product of these two um, gentlemen, Rob Moran and Brian Rosengarten, and their uh, wives were both diagnosed at the same time and they both called the Cancer Council and somebody there thought that they should connect and they did and they decided that there should be more um, out there for people living with myeloma and they formed Myeloma Victoria. They then met with other um, like-minded groups in New South Wales and South Australia and became Myeloma Australia um, and we are now present around the country. Uh, so that was um, in 1998 when they, this all began and Brian's wife is uh, still um, surviving and this month is 25 years since her diagnosis. So our five pillars um, that we work to um, with the myeloma community at the centre is to provide support, support 
information, education, research and advocacy for the myeloma community. We have a medical and scientific advisory group, which Andrew is um, a long serving member of, which is a group of haematologists and scientists from across Australia and New Zealand. And we get them together a few times a year to um, talk about all things myeloma, look at advocacy projects, new um, drug developments. They're all involved in um, development of clinical trials in Australia. They produce the clinical practice guidelines to um, myeloma in Australia. And they also coordinate the MAGIC um, uh, webinars, which is um, e education evenings for um, health professionals. We have um, 18 nurses now all around Australia, and we are now covering every state and territory. Um, we may not have a nurse situated in every state, but they certainly do cover them all. Um, we have at least one nurse in each of those areas, as you can see there. And um, Myeloma Australia's head office is in Melbourne. Here you'll see a gallery of all our wonderful nurses. With um, We have one nurse who's about to join us in Newcastle and we don't have her photo yet. She hasn't quite come on board. But these are the faces behind the phone. If you call Myeloma Australia or you, many of you will be familiar with some of the faces on the screen you see here. Our nurses are responsible for facilitating four nurse-led programs and they are our telephone support group, uh, sorry, support line, support groups, seminars and health professional education. And thank you, Henry, for giving our program such a great plug in your presentation. So our 1800 um, support line is available Monday to Friday from 9am to 5pm and that's um, Eastern Standard Time or Daylight Savings Time at the moment. And we have um, all of our myeloma nurses are uh, very experienced and we don't provide individual advice per se, but what we can do is walk you through some of the medical jargon or the healthcare system or just listen if you've got, you know, need to get something off your chest. There's no limit to the time that you can spend on the phone with the nurses. And what they can do is help unpack some concepts maybe or help you understand something a bit better and give you some um, tools and maybe questions to go back to your treating team with. We also have um, our information support groups and seminars where we give you access to um, leading health professionals from Australia and overseas um, in uh, either online seminars or face-to-face -face or um, support groups. We used to look like this, um, but in the last 18 months or so, it's been a bit more like this. Um, around the country, but we are very um, proud to have kept our, all our services running and keep this information um, happening across the country. Um, and just like tonight, it's great to see such a good turnout. The Myeloma community has really embraced the online um, information giving. We also have quite a number of resources. So if you go to our website, myeloma.org.au, you'll find lots of books, um, fact sheets, and my news magazine, some videos um, and you're hearing it here first tonight that we are also in the development of a podcast series. Um, Professor Spencer is one of our guests that you will hear coming up very soon um, and we'll be announcing when they're available in the not too distant future. We also get quite involved in advocacy. You'll see Henry there. He was one of our 38 mates in um, our major awareness campaign that happened in May this year. You can also um, see Nemo, Nat, Kiri are here tonight as well, some of our other 38 mates. We also um, get involved with new therapies that are being put forward to the PBAC to be listed on the PBS. We will um, often be approached by the PBAC for um, some feedback and some, we also give you the opportunity to, provide, to submit your own feedback into um, why certain drugs should be listed on the PBS for the myeloma community. We're also um, part of the Global Myeloma Action Network, which is facilitated by the International Myeloma Foundation. And it's a group of like-minded organizations from around the globe, getting together and supporting each other on different projects and, and using um, you know, strength in numbers to get advocacy projects um, happening. That's a very quick, brief um, overview of Myeloma Australia. If you are not receiving communications from us, you can subscribe through our website there. Um, there's the telephone number for the support line again. 
and our nurse's um, generic email address if you want to drop us a line. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks everyone. Thanks to the speakers. That was pretty amazing. And welcome to our Q&A session this evening. Um, I'm Karen and I'm the Deputy Chair of the Consumer Engagement Committee um, that is hosting this webinar tonight. In addition to our speaker, which I would like to uh, put your um, video on and mute yourself until um, I'm asking you a question, I would like to introduce as well Tiffany Kong. She is joining us today to the Q&A as well. Tiffany is a senior research fellow with uh, 20 years experience in uh, MM research and currently manages the research activity of Professor Andrew Spencer's Myeloma Research Group here at the Australian Center for Blood Diseases. This research activity includes preclinical evaluation of novel drugs, liquid biopsy projects, and clinical trial. Welcome, Tiffany. I also want to mention that Bailey Beer, as we have heard already, is a nurse manager and myeloma clinical nurse. So please feel free uh, to ask your related questions. Um, thanks to everyone who has put questions into the chat um, per email, uh, either per email um, before the webinar or during the talks. Um, please keep coming um, questions. As Cashin mentioned um, at the beginning, our experts are limited to answer questions or specific questions related to individual own medication circumstances, clinical diagnosis, or current treatments of MM. But they will be able to address general questions related to MM from both a clinical and research point of view, as well as any questions related to the work um, that has been presented to the webinar this evening. Um, so let's get started without any further delay um, with our first questions to our expert, expert panel, which goes to Henry. Um, Henry, what is the biggest learning you have taken away from this last six years? Uh, thanks, Karen. Thanks for the question. Mm. I suppose uh, I get in, I'm, I'm the sort of person that gets into uh, these things in depth, so I'll try to give you a very quick and in-depth answer. Um, I don't, I don't want to. From almost from the beginning, I didn't want to be defined as someone with myeloma, and I'm pretty careful about, you know, just saying to people out there, I've got myeloma. And you know, although this is not meant to sound dramatic, but I'll probably be succumb to myeloma eventually. Hopefully not from all the things we've heard today and the treatments that are available. But what I don't want to do is live uh, and be defined by myeloma. I've got now with myeloma a much bigger purpose, which is to be a better version of myself. And that's really my biggest learning, although I've got a lot of learnings from this journey I've been on over the last six years. But um, the, the big one is to be a better version of myself. And this is my opportunity. That's my biggest learning. And that's how I flip it from not being a victim to myeloma, but to be something, a survivor, but more than a survivor, a better person. Maybe just um, related to that, um, has the disease affected your relationship, your marriage, for example? Um, okay, well, I suppose let's, let's look at um, relation, what I've learned, and probably this is something for life anyway, but the myeloma has given it a pointy end for me and poked me, is that I can't have expectations of friends, relatives and so on, because sometimes they exceed those re expectations, other times they don't, but you get a real a real pointy sense of it from somebody who has a life-threatening illness. As far as my marriage is concerned, which is my close relationship, I have to say that um, I, every, a lot of what I've learned and what I know about love and having a good relationship, uh, I've had demonstrated to me by Jan, my wife, over the last six years. So 
I know it's a cliche to say, but it's true. It's just unconditional love. There's very few times where she has complained too much or um, not been honest with me that we can have a really good discussion. So I suppose from both of our points of view, the communication has improved. So I'd have to say, Karen, that it's been very positive from that point of view. Thanks a lot, Henry. Um, we have a couple of questions to, um, to therapies and new therapies. So Karen is asking, when can patients hope to have more targeted therapy available to them? Maybe I'll answer that one. Um, one of the, the defining features of myeloma treatment is that it's, for historical reasons, largely targeting plasma cells rather than malignant plasma cells, myeloma cells. So even new drugs like daratumumab target plasma cells. And I guess what we've been talking about this evening is targeting plasma cell cancer specific targets. So a slightly different paradigm. And I think there's now evidence emerging from various parts of the globe that this strategy actually can be effective. So I think what's going to happen is that we're going to have the broader anti-plasma cell backbone therapies. And as our understanding of genomics increases, we're going to introduce additional agents specific for that patient. And we're not there yet but I would estimate within the next few years that we're gonna start seeing more activity in that space. And as we've alluded to, we've got a clinical trial here that we're just kicking off that's very specific for these driver mutations in myeloma. So I think we're starting to get there, but it's a bit of a way yet. Thank you, Andrew. Um, there's another question with therapy, uh, which someone read it that vitamin C is effective in supporting myeloma treatments. Um, how do you see that? Yeah, this is a, uh, a thorny one. I need to be careful here. So there's the whole um, notion of, you know, antioxidants being good for us and you know there's a lot of work in that area showing that you know whether it's from drinking red wine or taking vitamins or whatever um but the 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 thing that's sort of lost on people is that antioxidants also protect cancer cells so they're not just good for good cells they're good for bad cells and in fact there's uh there have been some large clinical trials done not in myeloma but in some other cancers showing that large doses of vitamins, including vitamin C, actually lead to worse outcomes. And, you know, it's somewhat con contentious, but if you actually look at those bodies of work, it would argue that you just need a normal amount of vitamins and not uber doses, because it's not necessarily a good thing. Thank you. Um, we have a genetic question. MM doesn't have a specific genetic predisposition. However, her family has three females diagnosed, uh, fem sorry, three males diagnosed with cancer. So her husband and two family members met with uh, metastatic melanoma. Both of them died. Here's the question if it's a genetic predisposition to that cancer. Myeloma is even in terms of the predisposition, incredibly complicated. You know, we, we know certain disorders such as breast cancer or ovarian cancer, there are recognized genes, you know, BRCA genes, which lead to susceptibility. In myeloma, there have been large population studies done showing that there aren't any one thing that, that predisposes, but uh, lots of little things all contributing. But that fact notwithstanding, there's very strong evidence showing that there is a familial predisposition. So if you have a relative, a first degree relative with MGUS or myeloma, you've got a two to threefold higher likelihood of developing MGUS or myeloma compared to the population at large. So there is a genetic element to that. 
but you've got to keep in perspective that even if you've got that increased risk of myeloma, your risk of other diseases far outweighs the likelihood of getting myeloma. So yes, there is a genetic predisposition, but the actual nature of that is still not fully clear. Thank you. Durga, um, Bruce is asking what you mean by bone marrow tests only being success successful 70% of the time. Okay. Uh, so for our genetic analysis work or any kind of genetic analysis work, we need bone marrow cells to be of um, a certain quality. Uh, so if, uh, and most of the time we see uh, in our hands and in other trials as well, that only about 70% of the time we actually get any bone marrow material that is uh, good enough to do uh, downstream analysis, whether it is genomic analysis or fish or whether we do a Sky92 uh, profiler. So this is statistics that come out of um, the myeloma um, and related diseases registry uh, and statistics that we see that we have in our hand as well. Thank you. Um, will this PCR method be available for all uh, MM patients? If so, when that will be? And is it covered by Medicare? Sky 92, yes, this is a thorny issue. So um, this is a, a test which has now been approved by the FDA in the US and in Europe by the EMEA as a diagnostic. Um, and we've been utilizing it in clinical trials to help understand biology for about five years. And I think the last 12 to 18 months been using it in newly diagnosed patients here. Um, our research group has been bearing the cost of that because um, it's not covered by Medicare. Um, and we're now, we have regular interaction with its, it's a Dutch company that developed the, the platform from clinical trials they've undertaken. And they're now uh, in the process of approaching the TGA in Australia to get it approved as a diagnostic. The next challenge will be, then be getting the government to pay for it. So it's easy to get the TGA bit done. Uh, it's then the funding that um, is the issue. And we're trying to explore avenues to make it more readily available um, to patients because, you know, we can't continue to actually pay for it from our research funds, unfortunately. But, but um, we are hopeful that it will become more widely available in Australia. It's clearly, you know, a very useful tool for clinicians. Thank you. Um, Robin has a specific questions to Nick. How the, his research is shared with other hospitals because uh, she seems to work in Sydney. Um, so the, the research project has been kept um, fairly local in terms of acquiring the samples and, uh, and, and those sort of things. The results, um, actually some of those slides I showed were, were um, taken from a presentation I've just done at the National Blood Conference. Uh, and so as we get more results through, I'm hoping to sort of certainly disseminate the, um, uh, the information we've gained from, um, from that a lot more widely. Um, the, the issue with a lot of these trials is, is that everything needs ethics approval. Uh, and so um, the first part of the project, which I didn't really uh, explain, is that we're doing PET scans in patients that have got um, uh, high risk features for having extramedullary disease. So people who've been uh, had um, a number of lines of therapy or have had a past history of extramedullary disease. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, we also need to unfortunately keep a bit of a cap on how many patients we, we're sort of scanning, uh, because if we're, we're PET scans are quite an expensive thing um, to do on a clinical trial. Uh, at, a bit like the Sky 92, they're not yet Medicare rebatable for myeloma, which is a real shame because they're a really useful tool uh, in myeloma, particularly for patients like um, uh, patients who've got oligosecretory or non-secretory disease. Uh, so it would be wonderful to have things like PET scans on, on Medicare. Um, but because of that, we're sort of keeping the, the patients we're enrolling fairly local. Thank you, Nick. Um, we have another research question. Um, is there any research to predict myeloma relapse using microarrays? Well, in fact, the, the, the Sky92 platform is microarray. It's a, uh, an Affymetrix microarray platform. 
And in essence, if you're defined by SCAR 92 as having high risk disease, that's telling you that you're more likely to relapse early. That's really what it boils down to. And what that is telling us is that those standard of care treatments that we deliver to everyone the same at the moment are not really doing the job in the high risk patients. And so we've opened a number of clinical trials uh, that we've designed specifically focusing on these high risk patients. And we were in the process of negotiating a SCAR 92 directed clinical trial in newly diagnosed patients. So that is a microarray test that essentially predicts for early relapse. Great, thank you. Um, we have a specific question to Durga. What inspired you to be a researcher in myeloma versus other diseases? And um, thank you for doing it. Um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think for me, something in a translational area was sort of driving my passion. And I think uh, soon after my PhD, I met Professor Andrew Spencer, who kindly agreed to give me a position in his lab. Um, and I have uh, really enjoyed my journey here. I really love the liquid biopsy research. I'm quite passionate about it um, because I can see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. I know this will get to a point uh, where it can help patients. And I know uh, whatever I'm doing um, might, might, might not be maybe in the recent years, but in the future, uh, we will definitely get to a point uh, where I think we can do away with bone marrow biopsy and start doing liquid biopsies. Thank you, Durga. Um, can you please share with us what is the biggest hurdle forward um, to the speed of research to progress faster with uh, data, funding, time? Um, unequivocally, the biggest hurdle is money. Um, the funding landscape in Australia, we're grateful, you know, what, what the government provides, um, but um, only a small fraction of researchers with quite reasonable ideas which are of value actually succeed in getting funding. And um, it's actually getting harder and harder to get funding, we're finding. Um, we recently put in a clinical trial request for competitive funding, for example. Uh, there were 78 clinical trials submitted for this particular funding and three trials were funded. I mean, 75 trials just didn't get a look in. And this, this is sort of highlighting, I think, the major challenge. And this is not just clinical research, obviously it's laboratory research that we and others uh, undertake. So the real, the real struggle is, is ongoing research funding. And the key there is that it's not necessarily the ability to buy a machine or to buy reagents. The funding that is most valuable is to employ people because your scientists need some level of security. You can't say to them, well, I'm gonna employ you for six months and then see you later. And obviously there's some implications for the scientists themselves, but also, as you can see with Durga's work, this has matured over a number of years and you need that continuity and time. It's like a, it's like a wine, it has to mature before it becomes valuable. And it's, it's ensuring that continuation of funding that really enables outcomes to be generated. And without that continuation, it's really, really difficult to generate anything of value. So money is the biggest problem in Australia for researchers. The, um, the COVID-19 pandemic illustrated that really, really nicely, I think. And we saw the speed with which the vaccinations would be able to develop, building on technology that was already there, of course, but the speed that those um, trials were able to be designed and accrued and, and everything was um, a really good demonstration of what can happen if you've got a lot of very determined people with a lot of money. Yeah. Thanks, Nick and Andrew. Um, could the blood-based uh, marker, so liquid biopsy, used for or to identify all types of precancer or just myeloma? 
uh, they, they are used for uh, other malignancies and lung cancer actually uses um, liquid biopsies in the clinic. Uh, and one of the things that liquid biopsies are used for in other settings is actually um, uh, in fetal maternal medicine. Uh, and they actually use that um, the blood test, the liquid biopsy when they're uh, doing genetic testing on, on, um, uh, on fetuses while they're still in the uterus, which is a really um, cool way <laughs> just to think of it as well. Uh, do you actually know that there are any trials of um, liquid biopsy in Sydney? There are some researchers interested in the uh, extracellular vesicles that we spoke about, which are, I guess, part of liquid biopsies. But as far as we're aware, there are no groups working as we do in liquid biopsies in myeloma, looking at the genetics of the DNA and the RNA. So I'm not aware of any, no. There's a couple of, of the clinical trial overseas that are starting to use CFDNA in, in other kinds of um, lymphomas, for example, uh, and they need to be incorporated into the trials before we can start using them in patients in the clinic um, because we can do the test, but we still don't quite know what to do with the, the answers until they're done in a clinical, a clinical trial properly. Thank you. Um, Henry, we have a question for you, which I actually personally interested in your answer. Um, what's your thought on with engaging with researcher as a, from a patient point of view? Sorry, you're muted. Does help. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So, as I said, um, well, first of all, um, just being part of this today is inspiring. And I think there's been a number of people who've commented how, uh, who are patients, how good it is to hear what's going on behind the scenes. So it's really good to be part of this webinar. Um, I think, uh, as I also said in my talk, it's really important for the researchers or anybody providing clinical care for patients to engage with the patients. We have the lived experience. They're, obviously, we're not clinically qualified, but we have a lot of experience in our journey, in our myeloma journey. So I would continue to, or continue to be part of that communication and engagement if I can, and I encourage it to continue, Karen. Um, what do you personally think could patient add to research? Uh, Why well, is it so important that you as a patient are involved in research from your point of view? Well, um, I, I suppose uh, hope. Um, hope is a really good thing to have as a patient. So. I'm seeing this as a two-way conversation, Karen. It's like, talk to us about patients with the lived experience. Like, I wouldn't have ever thought about uh, the work that Derg is doing. You know, I just thought we were stuck with uh, bone marrow biopsies forever in a day. Um, but to know that that is happening, um, even if it was something the uh, the researchers have thought of to, um, to really communicate that back to us gives hope and positivity about the journey that we're on as myeloma patients. Thank you. Um, Haley. what are the key reasons why patients call the nurse helpline? Thanks, Karen. There's lots of reasons. Um, most commonly we get calls at at time points, you know, di newly diagnosis or at each relapse, because it could be many years between first being diagnosed with myeloma and then having to deal with a new um, type of treatment. So a lot can change in that time. So um, we, I'd say those time points are probably very common, as well as how to manage um, certain side effects like peripheral neuropathy, um, loss of um, appetite, uh, fatigue is obviously a huge um, problem for people living with myeloma caused by both the myeloma and the treatments. Um, so we can help um, talk through each individual's circumstances and point them in the direction of some resources or maybe allied health services um, that might be able to lend a hand. That is absolutely great work you are doing. Thank you for that. Thank you.
Um, we have one uh, re re uh, research question from a patient with 18 years uh, living with MM so far. Um, do researchers long term MM, do, do, do we know why people can survive so long and others don't? Yeah, so um, this is a conversation I have many, many times with patients, particularly newly diagnosed patients. And that's that myeloma is um, an incredibly heterogeneous disease. It's so if you've got a hundred patients with myeloma, you've got a hundred different myelomas. And um, it's trying to gauge or understand not only the bad players, but the really good players. Because if you could recognize patients with myeloma who are going to do better, you could actually contemplate treating them in a less aggressive fashion and so avoid toxicity and the impact on their quality of life. And that's one of the things that we're quite interested in in our clinical research programs, for example, being able to stratify patients because there's, there's a bit of a mindset of, well, we've got all these new drugs and just throw them at everybody like, you know, the kitchen sink, four or five drug combinations. And we don't think that's very scientific. Um, and I don't believe it is scientific. And there are implications for the patient and also for society, the societal costs of these sorts of combinations. So we can identify really good players with some fairly simple uh, prognostic tools at the time of diagnosis. And so we can identify patients now, if we use Sky 92, for example, with some clinical features, we can identify patients who are going to have an average survival of more than 10 years as a group. So, you know, you could contemplate, for example, designing specific studies in those patients where you might de-escalate therapy. Um, so we can identify these people to some degree, but we don't understand the biology beneath that more favorable behavior. Thank you, Andrew. Unfortunately, we start running out of time. So one last question um, from a patient. Are there any trials available for those who are past consultation and in remission? We are all know it will return eventually. Is there research underway to delay or prevent this? Um, in a word, no, not, not available in our jurisdiction. I think we probably undertook the only trial I, that, that I'm aware of, whereby in patients who had a response to therapy, but still had something detectable, but they'd responded. We actually then used a novel drug in those patients. We've recently published that data. And that was sort of looked upon as being a bit odd by other investigators, to be honest. Um, but we thought it was a reasonable idea. So um, unfortunately, no. Um, I, I do think, however, that with the greater uptake of what we call minimal residual disease monitoring, where people look like they have no myeloma, but you can still detect it at very low levels. There may be trials uh, in the near future where those patients could be treated to try and make them minimal residual disease negative. So I think, again, like more targeted approaches, I think we're moving that way, but it, it, it's slow. That's great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, um, as I said, unfortunately, we're coming uh, slowly uh, to the end of our first webinar. And on the behalf of the care committee, I would love to thank all the speakers for a great talk. It was really impressive. We got really good feedback. Um, I would like also to thank the Alfred Foundation and the Myeloma Australia Monash University for the great support um, of our care program and of the current webinar series. Um, special thanks uh, goes to Henry for sharing his personal uh, journey with us. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, thanks to all the care committee members. Uh, I would like to call out Viona, Iona, and Jury, who have worked 
tirelessly in the background and of course especially to our lead Kathleen as well as to Monash staff members in the background uh, who made this webinar uh, possible. Um, most of all, I would like to thank everyone who attended this webinar tonight. Um, we hope you found it informative and interesting. We uh, would very much like to hear your thoughts and opinions on the webinar as it is our first and we would like to improve for the future. Um, please fill in our survey that will pop up um, when we finish uh, the webinar um, to give you feedback. Thanks a lot. Have a lovely evening. Uh, stay safe and all the best. Bye bye.